Hello. Today's our lecture on indeterminacy in music. And boy, there's a lot we could talk about here. This should be a week of lectures and discussions and work. But we'll try to get it all done in one week and one day, I'm sorry. Um, now, I would like you to uh, open up. There's a file, a packet of scores, indeterminate scores. There's a link underneath this video that you can click on and uh, you can get these scores and I'm going to re be referring to them. So if you can please, you know, uh, download them and open them in another window. Uh, you won't really need to watch me that much. I'm not going to do much here, but at least, well, after my initial thing. And then also, if you could turn to right uh, page 109 of Dr. Hicks's packet, then we can refer to that. There's a few things we want to look at. But before we do that, let's talk in general terms about indeterminacy in music. And this is, again, a big, big topic. Um, as you may know, um, the history of, of Western Euro-American classical music, there was kind of a trend of eliminating all sort of improvisation or open elements in pieces of music really through the 19th century and then ending in the early or the first half of the 20th century when we see a lot of scores and we've looked at them scores that are extremely detailed and leave very little room for uh, sort of personal choice on the part of the performer and um, starting in the post-World War II period, uh, we start to see scores that embrace the idea of opening up the outcomes of a particular score or composition to improvisation or other uh, forms of, of variation in the way a composition manifests itself. And um, this came from many different uh, influences. Certainly, I think jazz, the phenomenon of jazz, which was a very powerful uh, musical force and beguiling to, certainly to classical composers of the 20th century. I'm gonna put this down a little bit. Um, but also lots of other forces. Now, let me say at the outset, um, if we look at the music of the world, uh, you know, from today or in the history, different eras, different places in the world, there's various gradations for music that's completely fixed and composed to music that's completely improvised and everything in between. The former, you know, you could make a continuum, since I've got a whiteboard, why not use it? You know, from, you know, determined to indetermined, uh, you know, we could put late 19th, early 20th century classical music there, some East Asian genres over here, Japanese gagaku, etc. And then over here, there's, you know, free improvisation, this kind of international modernist style, and lots of other, you know, kinds of music, uh, and a lot, a lot of music in the middle. But again, classical music has kind of lived over on this side for a while. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, composers, John Cage is one that comes up for sure, uh, became interested in opening things up to various uh, degrees of openness. Now, um, the, we have three terms that I would like to discuss. Um, and those are indeterminacy, maybe this is a lost cause, chance, and improvisation. 
and they get used kind of sloppily and uh, interchangeably somewhat and this has been a problem over the years so we're going to try to address this problem a little bit now indeterminacy where does that word come from uh well i believe john cage was the first to use it in reference to music music theory music composition and he borrowed it, of course, from physical sciences and mathematics. This is a, a term that was um, in vogue uh, in the 1930s and 40s when John Cage was writing about it. Maybe the 40s. Anyway, among scientists and, and sort of um, science-minded people, um, but certainly in the realm of, of particle physics, where you have uh, various situations in which you don't know the position of a particle. Um, again, I'm going to butcher the physics, so please don't show this to a physics professor. But um, again, situations where you can't measure something but you could uh, statistically determine a range of, of right answers in evaluating something. And in mathematics, there are lots of applications of indeterminacy. But, you know, if we think of the 20th century uh, physics, early 20th century physics, indeterminacy was a big, important concept that sort of upset the, uh, and it goes back further than that for sure, but upsets the sort of Newtonian uh, mechanical universe and makes it again more indeterminate so my point here is that that term was floating around and cage thought well here's um, here's a concept that's more in keeping with the world of the 20th century and where uh, pieces of music again that were ever more determinate more fixed in what they were by the composer. Um, Cage, I think, was beguiled by this idea that a piece of music um, didn't have to be fixed in that way. It could represent, again, this more relative, more uh, hard to pin down world that, that was happening. So in the realm of music, uh, you know, I wrote my master's thesis on compositions, I'm going to put this down for a second, compositions that uh, are indeterminate in nature, that have indeterminacy, which would be all compositions, really, to one degree or another. But um, I used the term composer determinacy, or in other words, to what extent or to what degree does a composer control uh, any aspect of a composition. And to me, that's what composer determinacy is. And so, uh, because if we're talking about indeterminacy in the, you know, physical world, um, it doesn't necessarily describe how music works, because music is made by people with volition, whereas the, the realm describing indeterminacy in physics is supposedly, and we could quibble about this, is describing uh, a forces in nature that are not uh, under the control of a, a uh, an agent uh, and with uh, desires, etc. And um, so the question is not, you know, is this indeterminate in the scientific sense, but is has the composer determined an outcome and so that's the important thing in these pieces that we'll be looking at is we're going to look at each parameter of music and a parameter is a fancy term again borrowed from science and math uh, in the realm of music parameters are like pitch duration um, etc uh, harmony rhythm melody uh, you know these are all parameters now, um, I'll get more specific about that in a moment. Okay, so indeterminacy is a very broad term indicating uh, 
composer determinacy or composer indeterminacy, areas in which a composer has left things not completely determined. Okay, what about chance? And I should add the term aleatory, or it's usually used as in the adjectival form aleatoric or aleatorical. Uh, you know, people love to use that word because it sounds super smart. Uh, but they, they mean essentially the same thing. I believe that alia is a word for dice in, in ancient Greek. But chance indicates a very specific way of making a decision, of determining something that has been left indeterminate by the composer, again, in, in the realm of music. So it's chance is a, is a type of decision making. Now we're familiar with chance procedures. Um, for instance, uh, you know, at the beginning of a football game, you'll toss a coin to determine who gets to decide the kickoff team. Um, we, uh, in playing other games have a lot more chance in them, chance procedures, methods of coming up with an unpredictable uh, de uh, set of data. Um, so games and sports. Then, of course, there are examples in the scriptures and in lots of religious texts and religious activities in which, uh, for instance, the uh, selection of the apostle to replace Judas. Uh, lots were cast to de decide between two candidates. Um, you remember when uh, Nephi and his brothers were deciding who to go in to get the plates from, from uh, Laban. They cast lots. In these cases, perhaps, this is maybe my thinking, is that, and certainly this is the case with a lot of religions and religious um, systems is that chance procedures are means of, of divining. They're, they're, they're not so much chance, they're uh, means of obtaining information from the divine or from divine sources. And um, so that's definitely in there. And of course that relates to music. Um, music has always been viewed as a divine art and uh, the making of music in pretty much every culture I can think of is associated with um, collaboration with with the divine or with the disembodied or with uh, you know higher energies I guess you could say so this idea of using a chance procedure to uh, divine information to make musical decisions that's a very old one, that's, and that's one that it would be hard to distance ourselves from that. Um, but in pieces that we may have a chance to look at, um, th this type of thing is in the foreground. And then finally, improvisation, which is, improvisation is uh, where a performer is composing in real time. And so there are lots and lots of genres of music in which the composer has left a lot of things open and the perform these are decisions that are to be made by the performer. And of course, jazz improvisation falls into this category and lots of other, this is probably the most common way of, of um, solving an ind indeterminate problem, if you could call it that, not really a problem, but through the uh, volition, the agency of the performers. In fact, this used to be radical for me to even say this, um, but improvisation and composition to me are essentially two versions of the same thing or two species of the same thing. You could even use the, the word compromisation. Um, improvisation being composition in real time and composition being asynchronous improvisation. I, th I think
I believe that. I think it's a good exercise to, to view these things this way. Um, there's a lot we could talk about, you know, if we talk about that and then we talk about why we make music in the first place, what music is, what a musical, a piece of music is, at what point does a piece of music or a composition not be a composition, at what point is the composer not the composer anymore, these are all questions that come up in this repertoire of music. Um, and some people are really disturbed by it. Okay, so in my system of uh, uh, indeterminacy, um, composer determinacy analysis that Dr. Hicks has included in his packet, that what that essentially was my master's degree. I thought, well, how do you analyze an indeterminate score? Of course, this is a different kind of analysis from harmonic analysis. Uh, the part that that's sort of not included or the weakness in the system is that uh, most analysis describes change over time in a piece of music. My system can do that, but it's not uh, set up really uh, obviously to do that. Um, and I, ha I haven't necessarily done that a lot. But um, it's, it's, I guess you could say it's a way of categorizing pieces of music according to their levels of composer determinacy. Now, so here's what you do. First of all, we start off with a parameter, musical parameter. And, you know, I think I'm just going to skip this. It's too hard. Musical parameter. Now, I mentioned earlier that... Uh, you could have any number of parameters. It just depends on how you break music down uh, into its bits and pieces. Um, and it also begs the question of what is music, which is a big question. And we, we haven't really gone through that. Of course, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. But, um, of course, Edgar Varese described music as organized sound. He felt like that was a very uh, broad definition of music. Then John Cage said, well, but there's some music, and certainly music that Cage wrote, that he didn't think of as being organized, in which the sound was not organized, at least by him or by uh, a human agent. So Cage... Uh, said music was sound. And then Robert Ashley, later, interesting composer, thought that was even too restrictive and said, well, music is, is uh, people getting together in some way or another. Okay, well, we don't have time to talk too much about that, but if we go back to Varese's definition of music as organized sound, also Varese was interesting because when people asked him what he did, he, he said, I don't want to be called a composer. I want to be called an artist's artist of frequency, uh, of rhythms and intensities. That's what it was. And his feeling was that rhythms uh, meant, uh, I guess, periodic or re repeated uh, events. Um, I think he might, you know, say, well, events, um, which include rhythm as we know it, um, but also frequency, which or pitch, which is again a repetitive event. So you repeat something some uh, fast enough, it becomes a vibration and thus a pitch. And then intensities, uh, meaning the the loudness or the softness of sounds made by these repetitive events. Now, I would say that um, that's a good, really reduced sort of, you know, unified theory. But it leaves out a couple of uh, parameters, and those are, you know, position in space and position in time. So, um, but in Western music, classical music, we don't, 
worry too much about when and where a piece is performed. Uh, we do have some music that it, where the positioning of the performers, the spatial aspect is part of the performance. We have a few pieces that have to be performed at certain times, but anyway. So in my sort of latest iteration of this theory of composer determinacy, uh, I sort of had a this maybe slightly less practical, but to me more correct rendering of the parameters of music. And that was um, where I said that music uh, consists of material, order, and duration. And um, anyway, you know, you can kind of, what's interesting about material, order, and duration is that, um, you know, material includes, you know, kind of everything that happens in a piece of music. And the order, uh, obviously what order, and the duration of each event or, or the, the entire event, uh, entire piece. Anyway, that I think is an interesting concept because then we can start looking at different pieces and asking, um, you know, whether the material order or duration are determined by the composer or not. But in Dr. Hicks's system, a version of the system, which is based on my earlier system, he breaks down, I think this is a very efficient um, and useful breakdown of the parameters. He says pitch, rhythm, intensity, in other words, loudness or softness, timbre, what instrument's being played, etc., and form, or the or order in which the sections of a piece are played. And then, um, so, we start with our parameters, then we, in an indeterminacy analysis at its most basic, we look at each parameter of a piece, or a section of a piece, or a bar, or any, we can chunk a piece however we want, and we say, okay, in this part of this piece, or in this whole piece, uh, is pitch, uh, what level of composer determinacy are we looking at? And uh, I isolated four levels of deter uh, composer determinacy. Again, if you can look on page 109 of Dr. Hicks's packet, we have composer determined, composer governed, composer optional, and composer indetermined. And uh, Dr. Ha Hicks has good definitions of each of these. Composer determined uh, the traditional situation in which the composer um, tells you what to do in that parameter. Composer governed, where uh, the performer is given uh, rules or principles by which to choose or the, to follow for what to play or sing. Composer optional, this is where a, this is kind of a subset of composer governed. This is where performers are given more than one option and they have to choose from those options in a given situation. And then composer indetermined where the uh, outcome is not determined at all by the composer. Now, uh, Dr. Hicks has given us some uh, good examples. Um, the Morton Feldman, two Morton Feldman pieces. Um, for piano, one is the intersection three, which uses graph paper. This is, and you know, if we had more time, we could go into the repertoire of this music. But Morton Feldman, who we've talked about a tiny bit already, associate of John Cage, part of this New York school that consisted of John Cage, Morton Feldman, Earl Brown, and Christian Wolf. Christian Wolf, the only one that's still alive. Um, all four of them wrote indeterminate pieces, but I, Feldman almost seems like the first to, to use what we would call graphic notation. So these are scores that, uh, you know, all scores are graphic, but these are scores that use symbols other than the conventional, you know, staff and note notation. So if you look on page 112, we have this graph paper piece, 
Um, and you have some instructions that Dr. Hicks has provided. So if you haven't already done that, you should have already done that. But um, try to do an indeterminacy analysis, which it would be on page 111 of each of these pieces. The example two on page 112 is this other piece by Feldman uh, called, it's a page of Feldman's work called Last Pieces. And um, you can see this is a piece in which the durations of each chord are left kind of open. Um, so look at those and see if you can come up with uh, indeterminacy analyses. Now I'd like you to pull up um, pull up the packet that I again that's below this uh, indeterminate scores packet and I'm going to show you some really cool scores, interesting scores, and um, I would encourage you to find recordings of each of these, which you can find very easily now. It didn't used to be that easy. Um, okay, so open that up, and you don't necessarily have, uh, well, anyway, hopefully you can look at this while you're listening to me. Okay. Page one, and I've put page numbers at the top of the, each page. Hopefully you can read those. So, page one, Cobra. This is, uh, this is, <laughs> I'm sure this score is a little bit confusing to some. This is by a composer named John Zorn, Z-O-R-N. And John Zorn, very important, influential composer, specialized in a type of composition called game pieces. And uh, I don't know that he necessarily invented this genre, but certainly developed it beyond anybody else I can think of. And this piece, Cobra, is by far the most, it's sort of like the fifth symphony of, of game pieces. Probably one of the most performed 20th century pieces in the world because there are people who have these Cobra societies where they get together every week all over the world and play this piece together as, as a game, as a, as a diversion, as a pastime. But it can also be performed as a, as a piece for an audience. And um, <clears throat> I'll give you a really quick rundown. Um, the concept here is that you have a prompter who's essentially a conductor, and he or she has a table with a series of cue cards. And if you look on the left column of this page, you'll notice um, all those boxes are cue cards. So the first thing the conductor or the prompter has to do is make cue cards that look like that, and they have different colors, mouth, yellow, nose, white, eye, orange, etc. So the cards are supposed to be those colors. And um, those cards represent different types of improvisation. Um, and so, um, so for instance, uh, pool is where, um, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting. Um, I'll have to skip that one because I forgot what that one means. Well, uh, substitute, no, substitute crossfade. That's where, that's uh, mouth four. So for instance, if the prompter holds up this card, um, and actually this is one where you kind of let the card down. If, uh, let's say you have an ensemble of ten people and four people are playing, well, when the prompter holds this up, and puts it down, the people who aren't playing start to fade in, and the people who are playing fade out. Um, and runner, mouth two, um, this is where the, um, I've forgotten these. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go on, because those, uh, you know, it's been years since I played this piece. 
I, I used to know it really well. I used to play it quite a bit. Um, if you know, look at Nose uh, 1, for instance, this is where when the uh, prompter puts this down, any member of the ensemble can make eye contact with another person on the ensemble and start a duo with that person. And there can be multiple duos simultaneously. Um, trades, uh, white two. This is where a member of the ensemble plays a note or some other sound and then makes eye contact with another person. And they respond to that and they make eye contact with another person you know, da -da, da, this kind of thing, passing sounds around the ensemble. Events, one, two, and three, this is nose three. Uh, the prompter holds up that card and either one, two, or three fingers. And when he puts the card down, it indicates that the each member of the ensemble has to play that number of events, usually not too long, discrete events without regard to coordinating with other members of the ensemble. Then we get to this area of cartoon trades. Um, and these are faster cartoon, faster trades, similar to the trades above. Ordered cartoon trades are where the sound gets passed around in a circle. The ensemble is supposed to sit in a circle. Then in the ear cues, the blue ones in the next area here, we have, uh, these are all changes. So music change, when the prompter puts that down, whoever's playing has to change the type of music that they're playing. Um, group change means that when the prompter puts the, um, cue card down and he indicates the people who should take over. There's one group from within the ensemble is replaced by another group indicated by the prompter. They have to continue playing the same music that the previous group was playing. Volume change, that's a crescendo or decrescendo. Then we get head red, one, two, and three. Sound memory, one, two, and three. Those are kind of fun. That's where the um, that's where um, when the prompter first indicates one of those cards, whatever music is happening at that moment, the people and the style of music is has to be remembered. And then if the prompter uses that card again later, you have to come back to that sound. It's almost you know kind of like a recording or something or a sequence. Um, and then on the right hand column. We have guerrilla systems, and uh, this is where uh, members of the ensemble can actually sort of rise up and and defeat, uh, sort of take over the game from the prompter by various means. Anyway, we don't have a ton of time to talk about all of this, but let's talk about it, you know, again in general forms and see if we can come up with a, you know, an analysis quickly. Now, the duration of this piece as a whole is um, not determined. It's composer indetermined. Um, you know, if we go down the line, pitch, well, you could say it's either indetermined or governed. So I, I guess there are certain ways, I would say more indetermined, but there may be certain areas in which uh, aspects of, of what the, uh, the game uh, requires might require a certain amount of interaction in the pitch. I, I think it's indetermined. Intensity, uh, somewhat governed. So some of these, um, some of these uh, indications, some of these cue cards might have a little bit of influence on the I don't know. In this piece, it's tricky because we would have to chunk it further because a lot of what happens is going to be determined by what the prompter does. So um, what the performers do is somewhat governed by the actions of the prompter. Uh, 
Then again, what the prompter does is more indetermined or perhaps governed a little bit. This is a tricky one. I, I don't know. This would take a while to come up with. Now again, you can see that this system of Pritif, um, it's, it's an opening, it's an entree for discussion, for conversation about a piece, which all analysis should be. You know, it's, analysis should be a way for a person to convey his or her uh, uh, ways of hearing or ways of experiencing a piece to another person. That's kind of what analysis is. Um, well, anyway, let's go to page two, three, and four. This is a very uh, <laughs> interesting piece. Christian Wolf, the last surviving member of the New York School, a piece called Edges. And um, you can see that the title page is page two. Then we have instructions on page three. Now, a lot of indeterminate uh, scores have a page of instructions, most of them, and then the actual score itself, which may or may not be graphic, as we have mentioned. Um, but page three in this um, packet is a series of instructions. The funny thing about this is he gives uh, definitions of all these different symbols well, most of them only appear once in the score, so it kind of begs the question, why, why have them, you know? But it looks really cool. It's a very interesting piece. And plus, there's the, um, it's almost impossible to determine how a performer is going to respond to different types of graphics, you know? Uh, conveying information. I mean, this is an art form, and if you're, uh, you know, performing... Uh, as a musician, there are so many uh, aspects of that activity which are um, hard to pin down, really. Okay, so he gives us these different um, symbols with these different descriptions, modulated, short, low resonance, directly after a long sound, sudden, light, long, extended. Some of those are quite specific. Uh, very useful in an, in, you know, for an improviser. So this is, you know, where the instrument, instrumentation is open. Um, and then we have, again, these very specific, uh, straightforward musical instructions that even a non-musician or someone who doesn't read music could easily read. And then we have some that are a little bit... Um, less straightforward, like bumpy, or uh, slack, filtered, medium in the middle, a little less, uh, a little more vague, I guess is the word. But the interesting thing about the, these instructions is he said, basically, I'll try to interpret it, don't actually play, when those come up in the score, don't actually play those instructions play, use those instructions to guide you. Uh, they're as kind of as boundaries or guideposts. So he even says, don't exploit them, you know. And um, so that's kind of interesting. And then he has the page of score, which is the next page. And of course, he says you, you don't have to, it's set up so that you can't go left to right, top to bottom. You're supposed to go where your eye leads you. And again, and then when you get to different symbols, you don't actually play those symbols. You use them, again, as uh, guideposts along a uh, sort of a liminal space, I guess you could say. Um, you know, again, if we were to look at this and look at each parameter, uh, pitch, you know, it depends on which symbol we're looking at. For instance, if we were to look at uh, um, modulate, modulated, if we come to modulated, well, what does that do for pitch? Uh, well, pitch, uh, 
vibrato is a type of modulation. So we could say that um, for that particular symbol, uh, the parameter of pitch is um, composer optional. Uh, then again, you could modulate something other than pitch. You can see it's kind of, this is a complicated one to, to do. Here's one, the regular old uh, crescendo symbol becoming louder, becoming audible. Well, this is suggesting, of course, the intensity. Uh, this is certainly composer governed, at least the intensity at that moment. Then again, once we mediate that with the instruction to not directly do the <laughs> symbol that you encounter, then it puts, it, again, it moves it somewhere else, I think, you know, to a certain extent governs. So I, you know, again, without going between all the different, uh, doing a, a detailed analysis, because uh, we have more pieces to look at, I think that we could make a case for composer uh, indetermined, governed or optional for, for most of these symbols. And again, these, the first, these first two are, are harder to, to examine. Um, if, why don't we, uh, just to kind of mediate here, let's go back to the Feldman pieces that are on page 112 and we'll try to make things a little more straightforward. The first piece, the um, intersection three at the top of page 112 in the Hicks packet again, you'll notice that, um, here I'll show you, this one here, you'll notice that we have these boxes and um, the top row indicates the upper range of, of the piano, the middle row, the middle range of the piano, and then the bottom row, the bottom range of the piano, you know, kind of like here, here, and here. And um, the numbers represent numbers of, of notes, or numbers of keys being pressed during the course of that box. Now those boxes are very short, uh, metronome equals 176, so each box is 176th of a minute, which is uh, a third, a third of a second, I guess, almost a third of a second. So, and he says you can attack these anywhere within that space, which a third of a second goes by pretty fast. I mean, 176, what's that? Um, you've got a little bit of space in there, so. So. Uh, in other pieces of his that use the same method but have longer or boxes that last more time, there's a little more room for um, wiggle room. But at any rate, in this piece, it's a little more straightforward. Pitch is governed because he's telling you uh, in each case in what region of the piano to make a sound. Uh, rhythm is definitely governed. Uh, you know, we might say determined, but he's giving you that little bit of wiggle room. So it's governed by, you know, okay, it has to be within the box. Uh, intensity, what does he say about intensity? Um, the player is free to choose any dynamic and to make any rhythmic entrance, etc. Any dynamic. So intensity is composer indetermined. Uh, the timbre is determined. It's supposed to be a piano. Uh, he doesn't really give you the option of doing inside piano sounds or other things. Form is composer determined. You go from beginning to end. There's no openness. You can't skip around or do things backwards. Okay? So there's an analysis of that. Um, <clears throat> Let's look at the, uh, the second piece, which is uh, out of last pieces, this one here. And in this case, pitch is determined. Okay, he's giving you, that's the one thing that really is determined. Um, rhythm, well, 
I would say, uh, I would say governed, maybe it might be a way to describe it, only because <clears throat> he says fast, he says durations are free, but you do have to go in, in order. Uh, so, you know, I think rhythm is governed by the tempo and by this uh, understanding that things have to be in the order they're presented. Um, uh, intensity, he says soft. So you could say uh, determined or, I mean, soft is a big category, so you might say govern, but either way. Timbre, again, it's a piano without any alterations, so timbre is, govern is determined. Form is determined. We go from beginning to end. Okay, so those are <laughs> a little more conventional in terms of this indeterminacy analysis. Okay, let's go back to the packet that I gave you. Um, page five. This is um, from a piece by Christian Wolf called For Five or Ten Players. And I've included the uh, instructions page and one page of score. This is kind of an interesting piece. It's supposed to be performed by either five or ten performers. I actually talked to Mr. Wolf about this, gosh, it was 15 years ago, and I said, well, can you perform it with between five and ten players, like six, seven, eight, nine? He said, no, it has to be either five or ten. And it's interesting because the five-person version sounds very different from the ten-person version. I mean, they're, in fact, the five-person version ends up being sort of pointillist, and the 10-person version ends up being kind of sound mass-esque, and we will talk about those, those types of music soon. <clears throat> okay, if you look on page 5, these are the instructions, and basically <clears throat> the most important part of these instructions are it describes what these different, they look like tadpoles, or kind of like notes, you know, these guys here, but he calls these coordinations, and I've included a little bit of, uh, I've cheated a little bit. These are graphical representations of each of those coordinations. You can do a little more reading on these if you want, but some of them indicate, you know, <clears throat> attack. You're always, when you're performing this piece, again, with, with an ensemble of either five or ten, open instrumentation or voice, <coughs> so any instruments, basically. Um, you listen for the next sound, or the next sounds, and then you respond to that when you encounter one of these coordination symbols. So uh, there's one coordination symbol that, symbol that indicates that when you hear the onset of a new sound, you attack with, with that onset, with that attack and then you cut off with the cutoff of that same sound. So for instance, I'd be listening, you know, there's music, uh, and then I'm a singer, which I'm not, and I hear something come out of the piano. It doesn't have to be the same, no. And then I release with it. There's another indication where I attack after the attack of the next sound, and then I release with it. So for instance, like this. La or I attack at will, and then I release with the attack of the next sound. So for instance, la, etc. I mean, there's one for almost every combination of that. So the, the um, and then there are a few other instructions, but the other aspect of this, and I'll show you the score page, well, you've got it. It's the next page. It's page five, but it's sideways. Each of these is a different, he calls them events. They're under these boxes. And those indicate either a single sound or some combination of sounds um, that includes, you know, descriptions of what you're supposed to play and how you're supposed to coordinate your sound or collections of sounds with the next sound that you hear, or in some cases, the second or the third or the fifth sound you hear, or in some cases, X amount of seconds after the 
next sound you hear. So um, <clears throat> the cool thing about this piece is that um, it kind of structures improvisation and it forces people to coordinate and listen to each other very carefully and it reduces you can't noodle in this piece. You have to, you know, be very strategic and, and careful in the sounds you make. So it creates a texture unlike any I know of. Um, the piece sounds different every time it's played, and yet it always sounds like itself, which to me is a huge achievement. Um, anyway, um, so again, I don't know that we have time to do, you could do the indeterminacy analysis uh, each little event is going to have a slightly different um, uh, different um, analysis and we could take the piece as a whole and give it its own analysis but um, in the interest of just exposing you to some more pieces I think I'll let you think about that on your own uh, oh look page seven I have Cobra again I apologize page eight there's a piece called She Was a Visitor by Robert Ashley. This is a really interesting piece for choir. Those of you who are choir uh, directors, this might be a fun one to do. Um, it's one that you can even involve an audience in. The basic concept here is that you have a leader who repeats this uh, phrase over and over again, she was a visitor, she was a visitor she was a visitor she was a visitor and then the members of the ensemble um, attack it's it, it's reminiscent of the the wolf piece they attack different phonemes simultaneously with the um, with the soloist and then kind of hold those out so it's almost like they're taking the the uh, adding some reverb to the the soloist's voice and there's a number of instructions as to how to play this and how, or sing it or speak it and how to make that work but similar to some of these other pieces the duration of the entire piece is is uh, not fixed it's either determined or governed by the I mean indetermined or governed by the composer um, so this this is an interesting one and then if you want to look on page nine this is going to be a piece where we might, well, we will talk about in the next, I think it's the next lecture, about minimalism. And this is uh, uh, an excerpt from the score for In C by Terry Riley, which among, uh, in addition to being sort of like the first classic minimalist piece, uh, is also an indeterminate score. And um, some of you may know this, it's quite well known. The concept here is we have a set of 53 little musical cells and this can be performed by uh, an ense ensemble of indeterminate instrumentation um, and everybody starts at the beginning, they share a common tempo um, and but each performer decides how many times to play each cell and then you go to number two you have to play every cell but you can decide for yourself how many times to play each cell within certain limits now some cells are in different meters and have different uh, lengths so the downbeats are going to vary from player to player but the um, eighth note pulse is going to be consistent um, So, uh, okay, what does this mean? Well, let's break this down. This is one we can fairly easily do an indeterminacy analysis of. So why don't we do that? And then, and then I'll let you, let you go. Okay, in C, pitch. Is pitch determined, governed, optional, or indetermined? Well, I would say it's determined. Um, I, I would say that's a pretty good, you don't really get any choices. You get to choose, you know, how many times to, and thus when you play these cells. But the pitch itself is determined. Um, 
<clears throat> rhythm. This one's a little trickier. I would say the rhythms themselves are determined. They're conventionally notated rhythms. You're not really given the uh, option to change them. But again, when and where they happen in the course of a piece is, is somewhat indetermined. The actual resulting sonority of the whole ensemble is, I would say, governed, but the individual activity is, um, is determined to a certain extent. Um, so, you know, that's a little fuzzy. Uh, intensity, let's see what he says. Um, uh, I can't remember. I think he says to play loudly at some point. So, <clears throat> intensity is somewhat governed. Timbre, um, you know, here's what he says. Any number of instruments can play. In general, the more players, the better it goes. Several keyboard instruments should be used as well as percussion instruments that are tuned. So it's, it's sort of indetermined or maybe governed a little bit in that he sort of gives you some uh, principles to follow. You know, include keyboard and pitch uh, percussion instruments. Um, form, I would say somewhere between governed and um, determined. So the actual form, the direction that it goes, where you start and where you end up is determined by the instructions and by the score. Um, the shape that takes in the middle of the piece is, uh, somewhat, is governed by the score, but not determined, I would say. Okay, well, there are lots of other pieces we could look at, but uh, I've already gone a little bit over. So I hope you have fun with this. Um, this is, again, something that, that I've certainly had an interest in. Of course, the, the um, Terry Riley piece has been a big influence on my own music. Uh, a couple of pieces in particular that I've written, one called Anomalous and another one called the Anatomy Series. Um, these are pieces that use similar ideas to this in C. Um, anyway, thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.